Hey, we're going to continue in our series uh, today called Redeem the Screen, and this is a series of messages that uh, Kyle Eidelman wrote uh, a little while back, and uh, we just felt like this would be a really helpful thing for our church to pick up because it's just so relevant at this time, uh, and it's, it's led, I think, to a lot of good conversations, right? Uh, maybe even some self-reflection on how we utilize, utilize technology, how we consume uh, just information. And uh, I certainly don't want this series to be uh, a long guilt trip series, like four weeks of just nothing but feeling bad for our use of technology. That's not our point at all. Uh, we simply want to look at our use of technology through the lens of Scripture. Uh, and instead, we want to leverage their use of, of technology for a way that honors God, right? We want to do it in a way that helps us grow closer to Jesus, uh, maybe closer to each other, that it prompts us to have better connections uh, with, with our family and maybe with, with even ourselves. But, but in order to get there, we have to kind of acknowledge the damage that can be caused by all of our different screens and our access to everything. And, and, and that damage includes being disconnected. Uh, sometimes from God and from others. And, and so we want to reclaim that. We want to redeem our use of technology, redeem our screens, and, and use them as a tool to develop ourselves, to encourage other people, as a tool for the church to help people find and follow Jesus. And so this conversation that we started last week began in Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. And, and this was like kind of a key verse for the whole series where Paul says, look, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't be like everybody else. Don't just fall into that, even inadvertently. Instead, we want to be transformed by changing the way that we think, by the renewing of our mind, he says, in order that we would look more like Jesus, and then we'll be able to really understand and prove and demonstrate what God's will is, because we'll be living in that. And so sometimes we start to wonder, well, what in the world does the Bible have to say for something so modern and current as our use of technology? But what we find supernaturally, I think, is that as we read the Scripture, those principles still speak very much to the situations that we find ourselves in today. And so very much so, I think that we begin to, to see how our use of technology actually plays right into some of these things that Paul says. So, for example, in chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Instead of fitting into the mold, even without thinking about it, instead of being conformed to the world around us, right? we just fit in and even unintentionally start to conform to the way everybody else thinks. And, and, and part of that is because we think about what we're exposed to the most and what we're exposed to the most tends to be our screens, and so we don't want to just accidentally fall into the same pattern as everybody else. Instead, we want to intentionally be transformed, intentionally be thinking about what is it that we're doing with our technology, and when we think about our screens, we're asking the question, which one are they doing? Are they helping us be transformed and become more like Jesus, or are they making us fit in with everybody else? Now, Paul is writing this letter to the Christians who are in Rome, and Rome was a culture like a little bit more akin to our culture than, than what we're used to reading about, certain about Jewish culture or Jesus and his culture, right? So Rome was a culture uh, filled with idolatry. Now, your first thought about idolatry might be that, <clears throat> okay, that's something for some ancient society, that's some primitive society. But no, there were all kinds of different temples in Rome that you could go in and worship, you could go in and, and praise you know, some different false gods or, or try to have, make some connection with, with some idol. And, and, and so Paul is contrasting that way of living. He's saying, listen, your true and proper way to worship is to offer yourself as a living sacrifice to the one true God. Instead of Right, putting your life out there uh, for all these other false gods, you want to live your life in a way that honors the one true God. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of stretch to see how that does begin to affect our modern use of technology and how we are using it to either connect to God or connect to all sorts of other false 
things. Let me just simply quote Kyle Adam. It says, instead of putting our screens on the altar before God, a lot of us have turned our screens into an altar where we sacrifice our time and our attention and our hearts and our motives. And so for these Christians in Rome, they didn't have access to our technology, but idolatry was certainly a big problem. And Paul is going to write about that and how big of a deal that is for them and how much of a contrast to the Christian life is supposed to be. In a similar way, I want us to recognize that, man, there are a lot of things in our culture that try to become idols for us. And that includes our use of phones and technology might not feel like a direct comparison, but as we read through this, I think you're going to find more and more it kind of keeps popping up, and it really is a pretty good illustration or maybe application for us. So Romans chapter 1, where he begins the book, is kind of openly talking about where their culture is. And in Romans chapter 1, he's speaking about that sort of culture that was pagan, that didn't really have any connection with God, and kind of where they were starting from in a worldview place, starting from their spiritual worldview or what their understanding of God was. And I think that if you'll, if you'll allow this to speak to us a little bit, maybe to our culture today, I, I think you're going to find that it fits quite closely. Now I'm going to read uh, chapter 1 in Romans, verses 21 to 23. I'm just going to read from the message paraphrase. Usually we use the NIV. I encourage you to go back and kind of read this whole passage. But I just like the way that this puts it for just this one little section. Uh, So we're going to read from the message paraphrase. I'll have it on the screen for you. Uh, This is what Paul says, starting in verse 21, Romans chapter 1. He says, People knew God perfectly well. But when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves. So they knew who God was, they just didn't treat him like God. They didn't worship him, they didn't acknowledge him as the source of truth, as the moral authority. They didn't base their their worldview on that knowledge that, okay, yeah, God does exist So they didn't have a knowledge problem. It wasn't that their culture didn't know about God. It's that they had an acknowledgement problem. They failed to recognize God for who he is. I think that's true today too, right? They just didn't acknowledge God. And because of that, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. Now that starts to sound a little familiar. Right? They became obsessed with all sorts of things out in the world that don't really matter. And meanwhile, they lost a real sense of true direction. A sense of of agreeing on what was right and wrong, what is true and false. And as a result, they lost a sense of direction for themselves. They trivialized their lives. They fall into all sorts of silliness and confusion. And they don't have a lot of direction. Man, that sounds like what's happened, I think, to a lot of folks today. I'm wondering maybe if the same issue that Paul's going to talk about with the Roman Christians is our issue today. It is that we, we are looking to all sorts of idols to do for us what only God can do for us. He continues, he says, They pretended to know it all, but were illiterate regarding life. Last week we talked about how, yeah, okay, we've got access to all the world's information. Are we really smarter and wiser for it? In fact, if anything, we're, we're sort of being tempted the same way that Adam and Eve were tempted back in the garden. Hey, if you just partake in this, you're going to know everything. And we kind of continue to fall for that temptation. We think that our lives will be better if we just immerse ourselves in all the information in the world. But the reality is we weren't created to handle all the constant bad news and all the constant drama and all the different arguments and fights and, 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 and all the things that all the information and access to it creates. And as a result, because we're not the creator, we're not the, the one who sees everything, Like we, we try to process all this stuff and we just can't handle it all. We get overwhelmed, and that results in us feeling disconnected, not more connected. It results in in making us feel more confused than informed. And we don't know who's telling us something that's true versus who's giving us their opinion, what the facts are from the spin. 
and all kinds of information, all kinds of facts and figures, but they had become illiterate to God's purpose in their life. And they traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. Right? They traded the glory of God for something that you could buy at a store, like the Verizon store. Right? We, we hear about adultery, and we think oh, that's just an ancient problem. Right? I'm never going to go into some little hut and worship some statue. And yet, if you look at what an idol really is, an idol is a cheap substitute for the living God. It's a cheap little man-made item That people worship instead of the God who made us. Kyle Adamant says, if an idol is something that serves as a cheap substitute for God, then we've never had more idols than we do right now. Right? The God has never had more competition. And the phone and the iPad and the television is the trinity of that new religion. A number of years ago, I was telling talking with a, a group of students. We, we had taken a group of students, high school students, to a Christian summer conference, and there were some times where we would spend in group, right, and, and kind of discuss themes for the day, and then uh, they'd have us do like a little activity. Sometimes it was a hands-on activity, and sometimes it was very straightforward, like a discussion. Other times it was a little weird. And this one was kind of weird. Like, I really was not expecting a lot. They had us get these high school teenagers, and, they hand, and we handed them Play-Doh, right? Uh, this is this is this is crazy, and and so the idea was we want you to sculpt out of Play-Doh something that you think you're tempted to idolize. What is something you're tempted to put in God's place in your life as top priority instead of God, instead of Jesus being number one to you? What is that thing that you're tempted to? And I was blown away. All the students like took it very seriously. They immediately like started working on something. I thought they were all going to be mad at me, you know, for getting out Plato. So by the way, if you've got a teenage student, apparently Plato's the way to do, to go to get their attention. Okay, and so let's pull that back out. But they sculpted all kinds of stuff, and immediately I think they were processing this lesson. One of them sculpted a softball and a softball bat. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, she she's really kind of thinking this through. Like she has given all her time to like, there's ball and school ball and travel ball and all these things, and it was just like that was consuming her. Uh, uh, One of the guys he he made sculpted a stick figure, right? And uh, I was kind of wondering where that was going, and he said, well, this is. This represents my girlfriend. I was like, well, don't show her that. Uh, but, uh, but I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, he gets it. You know, he's kind of put his girlfriend as, like, top priority in his life, and, and he's tempted to, like, put her in the position of God. Another student uh, made a dollar bill. I thought that was real creative, right, with, with Plato. And, uh, and, but they were, like, consumed with their, their weekend job, their summer job, and trying to make money and all those kind of things, realized that that was... That was become a higher priority for them than Jesus. One young lady who was really struggling, not with the project, but I think just emotionally really connected to the exercise, she was busy, like, and I remember it was pink (laughs) Play-Doh, and and she made this rectangle, and I'm just like, man, she's really struggling. Uh, She's like, I am worship a brick, and I don't know what she was going to say. But then she started drawing on it, and it was like, oh, I know exactly what that is, right? She, She made an iPhone out of her pink play-doh and she said yeah i think i think i'm really i'm making my phone my idol I mean, it just consumes my attention i don't talk to other people and she actually ended that session she handed it to one of our adult sponsors to keep for the rest of the week now here's the really kind of crazy that was more than 10 years ago right we wonder sometimes right why why we struggle with so much anxiety Because maybe we go and we worship by turning on our phones, kind of getting obsessed with everything that's happening out in the world, kind of get overwhelmed by all the information and all the current events that are happening, and we wonder why we have anxiety, or or, or, or we struggle in our relationships. It's because we're, we're so obsessed with what other people think, or how they perceive us, or the likes and the comments, 
And that's become idolatry to us, our, our reputation with other people. And Paul talks about these things, right, these idols, the fact that we want to offer our lives to God as a living sacrifice and not to these other things that are sort of worthless or that may confuse us. And, and we may not think of ourselves as people who typically are idolaters. We don't have all these idols that we worship, but when we start to consider the way that we use technology, it starts to fit. But here's the thing, like all idols, even our technology eventually will betray us, all right? You put all your hope into that. You ever put your hope and in, in your confidence into a piece of technology and then it just sort of ruins the day, gets you, gets you in trouble a little bit? I, I think about the way we use our phones sometimes and they just don't cooperate with us where we'll, we'll accidentally send a text to the wrong person, right? And they're like, oh, no, <laughs> that, was, that was for my... Husband, not my mom. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, or, we, or we send a group email and reply all instead of the one person that we wanted to share a private joke with. Or Like, oh gosh, how do I undo that? I'm going to get fired. Or, or we accidentally, you know, you're going through. I, I don't know if this happens to you. You guys ever do this? Um, I'll find people that I went to like high school or college with. And I'll just kind of check up and see how they're doing. My wife calls it cyber stalking. I just disagree. But um, when I do it, I guess. Um, but, but no, have you ever done this and you're like looking through and just seeing how somebody's kind of been living their life and all of a sudden you accidentally like a photo of theirs from like 15 years ago and it's like, creeper, right? And I just want to take that away and unlike it. And I'm like, oh, they're going to get a notification and it's just going to be weird. Were you ever like driving and using your phone as a GPS and it's about, the battery's about to die and you're in some unfamiliar area and you realize I've just sort of put my whole day, maybe my life, you know, in the hands of this device. Don't let me down now, you know. And there's a sense in which technology, much more dramatically than almost anything else, we, we depend on it so much that when it's gone or when it messes up, it it reveals to us the priority it has taken in our lives. Morgan Stanley had some research done. 91%, 91, 9 out of 10 people who own a smartphone keep it within an arm's length distance, within arm's reach, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Every single day, all day, all night, within arm's reach. Nine out of 10 of us. 68% of smart. Phone users, 7 out of 10, they, uh, they talk about they won't go anywhere without it, right? Had somebody this morning that said that they had to go back home to get their phone to bring it back because it couldn't be a church without it, right? I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what happened, right? Average smartphone user, that's you and me, we pick up our phone 80,000 times a year. 80,000 times, that's once every four minutes. All right, listen, here's the deal. The series is not anti-screens. We're not anti-technology. I, I realize like some of that's been the comments and the conversations we've sort of had with each other. Like, no, oh, I need this thing to work. I get it. Yeah, we all do. Right? Technology is not going anywhere. We're not trying to make it go anywhere. We're trying to become aware of how we're using it or how we're being used by it. Right? I wonder if we've gone from watching our screens to worshiping them. I, I wonder if we've gone to trading God who holds the whole world in his hands for a phone that we can hold in our hands. I wonder if we've got our own little temples that we carry around in our pockets everywhere we go and we can just go in and worship whenever we feel like it. Paul is talking to the church about their form of idolatry how they offer up their lives to all these different things that are going to let them down. But I think through time, the scripture that is still living and active is speaking to you and me about the idols that we carry. And how is it that we could go about offering ourselves to God as a living sacrifice on the altar saying, God, you have whatever you want from me. What does that look like? Here's some questions that I, I think that we can ask ourselves reflectively. 
We're going to be asking ourselves these questions to sort of reveal and dig out this question about has, has technology become an idol for us? And for many of us, I think we're all, we're all faced with this temptation. For many of us, I think we've, we've succumbed to it. So let's, let's kind of self-evaluate. But then also let's have, let's have some conversations with each other. Right? For accountability, let's, let's bring this up with our family. Let's talk about this with our spouse or with our kids or, or with our good friends or coworkers so that we can begin to kind of unravel some of what's been done through all this. First question is this, what do I consistently sacrifice my time for? You know, for a long time, you could say you could, you could tell your priorities by looking at your checkbook, right? The registry in your checkbook. Young people, a checkbook is what we used to pay bills with, right? And we used to kind of keep a paper log. Anyway, it's like looking at your bank statement. It used to be you could say how you spent your money revealed your priorities, okay? Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly true anymore. I think the commodity of our time is more uh, our our time. And, And here's the truth. Like, we all make maybe different amounts of money, but we all have exactly the same number of minutes each day. And so it sort of levels the playing field. It's not about rich or poor or anything like that. It's simply, we've all been given the exact same number of hours. It's how you spend it. You ever notice that the reason why sometimes we'll, we'll say, hey, uh, I, I didn't make it to that party, or, or hey, I was running late today, or whatever, and we usually give some reason. You know, hey, uh, uh, I, I haven't seen you lately. Where you been? And we'll say, I've just been busy. Right? Sometimes we even wear it as a badge of honor. You know, I'm just so busy lately. How's life been? Oh, man, we're, we're just slammed. We're busy. But what we really mean is this. I have the same amount of time you have. That just wasn't a priority to me. Now, if we had to say that every time, we weren't allowed to say I'm busy. We would say, you know, the reason why I was late is because you weren't a priority. Now, we would feel a lot worse, but we would be a lot more honest right? We don't want to have to say that, but that's the truth, right? We've all got the same amount of time, same number of minutes in the day, and so if we didn't get around to something, it's because that wasn't more important to us. Can we just start being honest with ourselves about that? That, hey, I do with my time what is most important to me, and I'm not too busy. Everybody else has the same amount of time. This wasn't my top priority, in fact, if anything, the, the screen time feature on our phones is probably going to at least be possible for, at least be practical or, or helpful for this one thing. For all those Christians who say, man, I just don't have time to pray. The screen time feature will show you that's not true. You've got lots of time. We just use it on different things. And, and so... What is it that I'm actually spending my time on? This is a really important reflective question. What gets gets most of my time? Because that's going to reveal my priority list. And that might be one of the places to start. In fact, we even got these stickers and and we handed them out. And Last service I didn't bring it up and I didn't bring it up again now. But um, but there's some uh, around. I'm sure some of you got them. But we got them in the next steps table. And it's just for you. It's it's a tool. It says disconnect to connect. And this is a phrase that our our student ministry has been using for a long time to, uh, to help the students. Like, hey, you've got literal people. Like around you. Like, let's have those conversations. You've got an opportunity to learn a lesson from the Bible. Like, let's engage with that. Because if, if your face is down in a phone or a device or something like that, you're not connecting with other people around you. And so they use that. Well, here's the thing. That's not a message for students. That's a message for our whole church, for every one of us, right? If, if, if we're looking down at a device, we're not looking at the people near us. And, and so we are all using our time how are we using our time differently? How are we prioritizing that? That's going to be a revealing question for self-reflection. Here's another one. What's the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning? Right? It's probably one of the most challenging things, by the way, about the digital detox that we did this past week. Was we, we, we had that day where it's like, all right, for the first hour in the morning, don't, don't even engage with, with screens. And man, that was really hard. Because, I mean, what am I so used to doing? If you're anything like me, it's like I wake up in the morning and the first thing I do is reach over for that device. i got to check up what's going on. 
And I mean, that's the way they're built. That's the way all of that technology is designed. It's designed to make us crave catching up. What did I miss? What did I miss in the six, seven hours that I was unplugged? Because I'm sure it was life-changing, right? Like, I have to see this. John Piper even calls it, he calls it, uh, there's, it's like all different candy. We just rush to it first thing in the morning. He, he calls it novelty candy, right? What's new? What, is, what has happened? What did I miss? We all have this fear of missing out, right? The FOMO that attacks every one of us first thing in the morning. We don't want to miss anything that was really important. I want to catch the score of the game that I fell asleep watching the night before, right? What, what did I miss? Or the ego candy. What have people been saying about me since I was asleep, right? How many likes did I get? Who got in the comment section? Who tagged me, right? Who sent me a message? Feeds our ego, makes us feel important. Or entertainment candy, right? We just want this, this first moment when we wake up to just start to feel good, set our day off right. But the reality is that those things let us down, right? We, we know that the better way to kind of start our day would probably be to just take a minute and be quiet and just kind of collect our thoughts, let our, let our brain, let our heart wake up. Maybe we take a few minutes and we talk to God in prayer, or, or we read some scripture, hey, before I do anything else, let me let, me let this be the first thing that kind of comes in, you know? Or, or second, you know, coffee first, Bible second. That's fine, okay, we're, I'm with you, okay? Maybe I sit down and spend a few minutes talking with my spouse or my family because we're not going to see each other for the next, you know, eight, ten hours. There's all kinds of things that would set us up to have a good day, but we are programmed we are conditioned. We're like, a, we're like a salivating dog when the food bowl gets open, right? It's like we just wake up and reach for that thing. Psalm chapter 5, verse 3 says, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice, and I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. The relationship that he has with God is like, that's the first conversation. That's the first interaction is with God, and God gets to hear what's on our heart and what's on our mind. Is that true of you? I would love for this to be something that is true of our church family. We commit ourselves to and know that, hey, there are dozens and dozens of other people from Compass doing this first thing when they wake up too. There are thousands and maybe even millions of other Christians around the country like that have kind of resolved to say, you know what, we're going to redeem our use of technology. The first thing we're going to do in the morning is not just going to be look at a screen. We're going to engage. We're going to engage with God and with ourselves and with with our family. Because too often, here's the deal, too often we turn our face away from the God of heaven and we turn it towards this glowing rectangle thinking that it's going to provide what only God was meant to. What we're doing is we're bowing down. That's what worship is. It, it, It literally comes from a word that means to bow before to humble ourselves before. I don't know if you're like me, but I got this like constant physical like pain thing in my neck and goes down to my shoulder blade, you know? Like I'll go to the chiropractor for it or whatever. And you know where that comes from, right? It comes from this. And that's like my physical reminder that, man, I've been bowing down before this screen all week. And I can't say that's ever been true of my worship before God. What's the first thing you look up when you wake up? And where do we turn for comfort when we're hurting? Another question we can ask ourselves. Where do you first go for comfort? Right? Because that has a way of showing what you, what you run to sort of has a way of showing what you value. And what we do first when we're hurting kind of reveals where we are looking for our hope and our help. And for a lot of us, when we get stressed out, we run to technology. Want to zone out from everything else, want to put the headphones on, want to sort of detach for a little bit. Maybe you and your spouse have, a, have an argument, maybe a difficult day at work. Whatever it is, first thing we do is we run into the temple of the screen. Or we go and we find Amazon and we, we run up a bunch of you know, charges so that we can get those boxes coming in. Anything that like, start making us feel better. Or we, we hit that dopamine just a little harder. Those little clicks, those little likes, the scrolling to see what's next, just so we can start to regulate those chemicals in our brain a little bit more. 
We feel detached from other people, and so we'll go and we'll start searching for some photos, maybe some videos, and we know where that's going to lead. It'll make us feel good for a minute. Pornographic website, just like a pagan temple. You just go in there and maybe you feel better for a minute, but then it just leaves you empty. We numb ourselves out by binge watching a show. Henry Blackaby defines an idol as anything you turn to for help when God told you to turn to him for help. Question number four out of six, where do I turn for direction when I'm confused about something? Man, this is a big one, right? Where, where, do, you, where do you ask your questions? Where do you go with them first? Well, maybe you Google it. Maybe you post a poll on Facebook. And I've noticed I use Facebook. And so it's like, it'll turn my question into like a poll. Like you're not just commenting, you're actually answering. You're being very helpful. Thank you for commenting. You know, it's like you're being very helpful. And, and the reality is that God has told us to seek his counsel first. In fact, Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. But increasingly, we tend to use our screens and lean on them to make our paths straight. And the Bible would call that idolatry. In fact, there, there was a 60% increase over the last couple of years uh, of, of the number of searches, of what is the best blank for me, right? All sorts of searches, like what's the best hairstyle for me? What's the best job for me? Best diet for me? Best college for me? Best dog for my personality, right? What's the best outfit for me or relationship for me? What's the best exercise routine? What's the best state for me to live in? We all know this, North Carolina. And, and what's the best resolution all right, for me to make? Or what's the best match for me? Or what's the best option? We do all these things. What's the best blank for me? And we'll go and we'll ask technology that. Did we ask God? At all? Let alone first? See, we're using technology not just to get information. Do you, we're using it to get direction for our lives. That's a shift. It's a shift that we've been kind of led to, but you need to become aware of it. And so the, one of the most popular searches that, that Google gets starts with, should I? All right? These are the questions that we're asking. Should I? Should I get bangs? You know? Should I quit my job? Should I get the flu shot? Should I retire? Should I refinance? Not today. Should I go to work? Should I go to therapy? Should I go out tonight? Should I make the first move? Right? Should I join LinkedIn? No. Should I make a Tinder account? Definitely no. Should I stop vaping? Should I stop eating meat? Should I start talking to him? Should I start drinking coffee? Should I stay married? Should I go to the ER? We ask all these questions of technology. What should I do with my life? And, and, and I wonder, is God just watching? And saying, you know I'm ready to answer your question when you're ready to bring it to me, right? Like I would love for you to bring that question to me. As a loving father. Kyle Adelman says, we keep saying, hey Siri, instead of hey God. Friends, that's idolatry. So in Romans chapter 12, Paul says, hey, maybe you're being conformed to the pattern of this world. It's going to lead you to this place of confusion and trivialization and silliness. Instead of clarity and determination your feet being on rock solid ground. And, and, and so he says, listen, if you will be transformed by changing the way you think, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And sometimes I think that we forget that God has promised that we'll know what he thinks we should do. What would be the best blank for us? And he's told us how we can know that. Start conforming ourselves to the way he thinks. And then we'll know. In fact, we'll be able to show and demonstrate what God's will really is for us. Now, question number five, where do I turn for satisfaction when I feel empty? Right? 
And I think this is the way social media is designed. It's all designed to create and breed a certain amount of discontentment. All right, we're going we're gonna to look at other people's highlight reel, all the cool things that they get to do, all the great places that they get to go. Right? You know that you never see a picture of somebody that hasn't been cropped and angled and filtered and all this kind of, right? We know that, right? Hashtag no filter baloney. I don't believe you, right? I don't. You're two-dimensional. You're a three-dimensional being. Anyway, we'll go there some other time. Maybe you start to feel like you're spending a little bit of money <laughs> shopping online, and you realize, okay, that's a little out of control, or you start to feel a little bit empty, and so you realize, man, I've been looking to, to like images and videos to sort of make me feel a little full, but that's not working. In, in Rome, there were numerous temples where you could go in and worship all these different idols, and one of the most popular places to go were, were idols of sexual pleasure. You would go in and worship there. And, and we might find that crazy or vulgar or way outside a board, but, but today we do exactly the same thing. We just carry those temples around in our pockets, and we pull those out, and we go in and worship anytime we want, right? Porn does this. It promises a resolution to loneliness, but it just leaves us feeling lonely. It promises a, a, a moment of pleasure, but it really just poisons us. The porn industry is a $12 billion a year industry just in the United States. Worldwide, it's nearly a $100 billion industry. There's more internet traffic on porn websites than on Netflix, Amazon, and Instagram combined every month. America's going to these temples, right? Because we just want to feel better. Life is hard, stressful. I'm tired. I feel alone, I feel disconnected, and I don't want to feel that way anymore. But we are looking to all sorts of things that don't satisfy to make us feel better, and it's just not going to work. Number six, where do I turn for validation when I feel insecure? Right? This is why we crop and filter our photos, because we want other people to like them like us, to comment, to follow, to heart. Meanwhile, the God of the universe who knit you together in your mother's womb, if you would just give him a minute, he's probably got a few things he would say to you about what he thinks when he looks at you. About the beauty that he made with his hands as a son or as a daughter. The value that you have to him is so much. You're not going to find your completion in social media. You're not going to find it with technology. We go to Pinterest so that we can pin up all kinds of pictures of things that we wish we had in our homes because we're just not content anymore. And I'm not anti-social media. I'm not anti-pictures. I'm not anti-Pinterest. But it's just like it can become an exercise in all the things we wish we had different. Or your desire for intimacy with no strings attached, so you go on Tinder and look for some hookup. And all these things are just smoke screens for what we're really craving. And technology's never going to deliver on it. Promises real intimacy, but there's no real intimacy to be had outside of our relationship with God. It is just a cheap imitation. So it's an idol for a lot of us. Psalm 37, verse 4, take delight in the Lord. and He will give you the desires of your heart. Hmm. Some of you know this because you, you've searched for answers for a long time. You just end up with more questions. You've searched for comfort, but you wind up still feeling troubled. You've searched for satisfaction and pleasure, but you just find yourself feeling Shamed and unsatisfied. You, you search for validation, but you just become more insecure. And it's almost like, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. You're talking to somebody, and they're like not making any eye contact. They're just kind of, uh-huh, yeah. Mm. And it's because they're on their device. Do you ever do this? Can't do it all the time, but once in a while, just, just stop talking. See how long it takes them 
to notice, right? To look up, you know. You, know, you might start a fight, and I'm sorry. You, <laughs> Pastor Marty told me to do this. Um, and it's almost like we're doing all this stuff, and God's just kind of like, I'll wait. I'll wait till you're done. I got something to say to you, but I want your attention first. I'm not going to compete with your technology. It reminds me of Luke chapter 10. Jesus goes into the home of his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and the Bible tells us that there were preparations. I don't know, just a big crowd over that day, or they were making the meal, or they were just fixing things. I don't know. The Bible just simply says that Martha was really distracted by all kinds of things, getting the house ready, but Mary, her sister, was sitting in front of Jesus, listening to Jesus teach. And so Martha, at some point, just kind of loses her patience and says, Jesus, listen, can't you tell my sister to help me? I'm doing everything by myself. You know, it's just it's time for her to pitch in and do her fair share. And Jesus responds to Martha. She says, Martha, or he says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. In fact, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. My prayer is that that would become the posture of us. That we would choose what is better. There's a lot of other stuff that's busy. Maybe it's important, but we're distracted by it. And when we're distracted, we're trivializing life, and we're, we're giving our attention to all sorts of other things, and Jesus is just inviting us, look, give me all your attention. Focus in. This is better. Took our family out to ice cream a little while back, and um, uh, we always get the little spoons first, right? <laughs> then the best part about getting ice cream is you can sample everything. And, uh, and and we all like made our selections or whatever. And my oldest, Sadie, I noticed we were all eating our ice cream, and we had gotten the, the spoons and everything. Sadie's still eating her ice cream, but with the little mini spoon, like the little Barbie spoon that they give you. I was like, baby, what are you doing? You're like, that's going to melt. It was still warm out. I was like, that's going to melt before you're finished because you're eating it so slow with that tiny little spoon and everything. But I wonder, that's kind of how, that's kind of how some of us take in all that God has for us, right? All the joy of being in worship of him, all the wisdom of reading his word and knowing how he wants us to live in our world, all of the peace and the hope that comes from knowing that our relationship is secure in him. All of that that comes from our daily, regular connection with God. And, and we could have that. It's all right there. It's right there for you. As much of God as you want, as much wisdom as you want, as much joy as you want, he is there. He is ready. Bring it. It's yours. And we show up with our tiny little Barbie spoon, and we're just like, oh, that's enough. It's cool. Just, we're just not going to finish. We're not going to get all that he has for us until we really develop that appetite, until we really say no and calm down some of this other stuff and lean into him. And it's because it's, it's our temptation, right? This is our culture. It's our temptation to idolize all these other things and let them take God's place. There's really only one biblical response to idolatry, uh, and, and that's repentance. And uh, I wonder if we can, as we begin to sort of make the turn to the next couple of weeks, how we can leverage technology for growing in, in our relationship with Jesus and helping other people and make good connections with other people. I wonder if this is where we kind of need to start. Is we need to start with repentance and just acknowledge God. And there's a lot of ways we've messed this up. So can I lead us in that time? And, and when we're done, we're, we're going to invite you to move we can give you a little bit of space to maybe process what God's putting on your heart, have a little conversation with him. Uh, the band's going to play kind of quietly for a moment. And we also have communion available at this time. If you're a believer in Jesus, there's three tables in the back, two in the front that are prepared with bread and juice that remind us that Jesus gave his life for us on the cross, that he died so all of our sin could be forgiven and wiped out and we can be made new. Through our trust in Jesus, we have this new relationship. We're restored with God. And because God raised him from the dead, we get to live forever too. 
We got a living hope. So the question is, how, how are you living now? Right? Eternal life is not just one day when we die and go to heaven. Eternal life starts when you decide to follow Jesus. Are you experiencing that today? Did you let go of some stuff? And lead us in a time of just repenting, just changing our mind, changing our heart, saying, God, I'm sorry, help me, help me do this right. And if you're willing, would you just join me in prayer together? God, we uh, as a church want to acknowledge that you deserve our full attention. And we are sorry for the times that we have gotten so distracted. Lord, we're sorry for the times that we have spent this week worshiping at pagan temples. And we've come into church like it's just another just another room. God, I pray that we would recognize there's a big difference. You deserve our whole hearts. Father, I'm, I'm sorry for the ways that we look to screens and technology to do for us what only you can do for us. Help us to want you and nothing else. Lord, I'm sorry for the mornings where I've started off my day looking at a screen instead of looking to you. Would you help us to start off our days with our eyes on you and nothing else? Sorry for the times, Father, that we have looked for direction for our lives more from technology and searches than from the scriptures. We want what you want for us and nothing else. Lord, we're sorry for the times when we're hurting and struggling and we try to find comfort and distraction from a screen instead of comfort and strength from you. Lord, help us to want you and nothing else. We're sorry for the times we look for validation and value from the likes and the comments and the follows rather than what you say is true about us. Jesus, help us as a church to declare with our lives that there is nothing else we want more. than to be close to you. We pray in Jesus' name.